Let's talk about creating a space for difficult, complicated, important conversations. Hello, everyone. I'm James Milan, and welcome to this episode of Let's Talk About. Let's Talk About is a series uh, that we do here at ACMI, which is all about creating the space for tough conversations, for difficult topics, for deep candor around those things, for respectful listening, et cetera. And we're really glad that you are here joining my colleague, Joanne Clinton, and myself. Um, we will continue to co-host these conversations. We anticipate, and our guest today is Nala J. Wu, who is a local, uh, uh, who is an Arlingtonian at the moment, not born and raised here, but resident here in Arlington, a design artist and activist. And what we're going to talk about today is the issue of identity. Um, identity is a big one, as I'm sure everybody knows, um, and a very complicated one. And we plan to get into it by first sharing a talk that Nala gave a couple of years ago, um, a moth hour style talk uh, that we are going to all watch, uh, and then we will have a conversation that comes out of that of, of watching that video and of all the things that Nala brings up in there. So I'd like to begin, first of all, by thanking you Thank for you being here. Thank you for having here. me. Now, I always appreciate people taking the time to come in and talk to us, number one. Number two, importantly, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience and the video, get, provide some context for what it is we're going to be listening to? Yeah, of course. Um, hi, uh, my name is Nala Urjay. Uh, my pronouns are they, them, and I am a proud uh, openly queer, trans, non-binary, uh, Chinese-American. Uh, I am an art director who works full-time in tabletop uh, role-playing games industry. Uh, and I also do voice acting and sensitivity consulting and uh, actual play performance. I love theater. Um, I was born in southern China, uh, adopted, and I grew up in Acton, Massachusetts. Um, and this talk that uh, we are sort of doing a talk back uh, about is a story that I told at a storytelling event, very similar in format to the Moth Radio, um, I think like two years ago. Um, the theme of the night was gratitude. It was right around Thanksgiving. Um, and in the talk that I told, um, my story was centered around the duality of gratitude from the perspective of someone who was adopted and who has been told their entire lives that I should be grateful for being here. And that's something that I've been wrestling with my entire life. And I really wanted to bring that perspective to a night of stories where everybody was going to be talking about gratitude in some way, shape, or form. Great. So let's go ahead and watch the video and then let's get down and dirty with a good <laughs> chat. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Tonight I would like to talk about Sonder. S-O-N-D-E-R, Sonder. It's a noun defined as the realization that every random passerby is living a life as vivid and complex as your own, populated with their own ambitions, triumphs, sorrows, and worries, hundreds of thousands of stories that are being written simultaneously around your own awareness. Stories in which you might only appear once, as a blur of traffic passing on the highway, or as a lit window at dusk. Hundreds of thousands of lives that you'll never even know existed. And it isn't until you start listening to those around you that you'll begin the wonderful and beautiful and effervescent lives being lived around your own. The art of storytelling is an oral tradition that predates written language and is able to elicit such powerful feelings in everyone who chooses to participate. I've walked in tonight a complete stranger to most of you, and in spirit of my favorite word, as defined by the Dictionary of Obscure Sorrows, Sonder, I hope that in sharing of myself tonight, you can start being more attentive to those around you. This is a story about me. My name is Nala Jaden Wu. I use they and pronouns, and I'm a proud, openly queer, and trans, non-binary, 
Southern Chinese American. For those who knew me when I was in high school or younger, you're probably hearing that entire phrase for the first time. Surprise, I am a gay and they. <laughs> and if what I just said scares you for some reason, I mean, I'm not sure why, I'm literally five feet tall. <laughs> you also might notice me looking down here. I've got ADHD, and if I don't have notes to keep me on track tonight, I will talk all night, and you don't want that. <laughs> this is a story about me. I was born in 1999, and I am 23 years old. Probably just made some of y'all feel a bit old, <laughs> sorry. Uh, meanwhile, any Gen Zers here uh, probably are like, oh, well, your birth year starts with a 19. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, joke's on you, because I'm technically Gen Z as well, but I don't always relate to everything our generation is known for. I wasn't born with a device in my hand, as I've often heard said. I watched VHS tapes rewind and sat on those long car rides with those giant paper maps printed on the thinnest, most rippable paper. <laughs> I remember a time before everything was wireless, a time before Blu-ray, a time where if I wanted to talk to my friends on the phone, I had to dial a landline first and then talk to their parents before I could talk to them. <laughs> Gen Z gets a bad rap. We are called the selfie generation, the I generation. Uh, which the I refers both to our attachment to technology and also our apparent selfishness, because how dare we ask for basic human rights. But in the words of your generations, I'll circle back to that one. This is a story about me, and I'm relatively good at following directions. The theme of tonight's stories is gratitude, which is a word I've heard thrown about my entire life. Did anyone else uh, first learn about Thanksgiving framed where the pilgrims and the Native Americans sat down together to eat a shared meal and then nothing bad happened after that? <laughs> <laughs> I think my teachers left out some very important information. Information that I didn't learn until much later. Gratitude. A grateful attitude. My Thanksgiving dinners began uh, with everyone going around the table sharing something that they are grateful for. You're expected to have something that is just sappy enough to satisfy your parents <laughs> while also being unique enough that you're not just repeating what the next person said. My typical table share during this most fun part of Thanksgiving <laughs> is talking about how grateful I am to be adopted. This is a story about me and when I was eight months old, I was adopted from China. Being adopted has affected my life in a lot of ways. And if you don't know anyone who is adopted, or more importantly, know any adoptees well enough that they would have shared with you even the tip of the iceberg of issues that adoptees face throughout their lives, especially those who are internationally and or transracially adopted, then I do hope you're listening. A uh, quick sidebar, because not everyone knows. International adoption is when you are born in one country and adopted by people who live in another country. And transracial adoptions are when a child, usually a child of color, is adopted by a family of a different ethnicity, usually white. I don't have time tonight to go into all the details of adoption trauma, like how the fear of being abandoned again had me wondering at age four what I possibly could have done wrong because it really is messed up for a kid to go through all the same things as all the other kids, except I wasn't just exploring my identity to figure out who I was and who I wanted to be, but on top of that, I was agonizing over all the questions of my past while struggling to believe I'd ever get to have a future. I was a teenager yearning not for the bliss of young love, but for an identity to call my own, something tangible. I have lived my entire life walking a thin line between two worlds, existing as the hyphen between the words Chinese American. Not Chinese enough, because despite studying it for 14 years, I cannot speak the language of my mother's land. And yet I'm not truly the American either, am I? The vitriol that my community has faced and continue to face in the wake of this ongoing pandemic only shows me that no amount of assimilation will ever get white America to fully accept us. We will always be seen as other. And yet, 
Being able to come to America, I've been told, was a blessing. America, the land of opportunity, where anyone can become someone. I know now that it's much more complicated than that. The American dream is a sham, a hopeful delusion. But I'm lucky, they said. All it takes is hard work to make it, they said. They expected gratitude for what I was given, a gift from a God I no longer believe in. I'm sure you can imagine how confusing and disorienting this all is. Being a student at AB was hard enough, now tack on an identity crisis stretching across international borders. There's one thing to take away from my story tonight, it's that gratitude is complicated. When I actually sit down to think about it though, something I am grateful for is the internet. And before you scoff and judge me for saying that, because how Gen Z of me to do so, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Let me say it loud and clear. The internet, quite literally, has saved my life. Uh, I'm going to rewind for a moment while I give you the spark notes on my life thus far. Uh, that is the website your kids go to to avoid reading any of the stuff assigned in English class. <laughs> I was abandoned at birth just days after being born and left in a cardboard box at the gates of a middle school. I was then adopted and moved nearly 8,000 miles away from the only home I ever knew before my first birthday. In elementary school, all my friends bullied me because I was weird and they didn't want to be friends with me anymore. But the weird that they hated so much was actually undiagnosed ADHD manifesting in neurodivergent behaviors that my peers made fun of because kids are mean and parents weren't teaching tolerance back then like I see them do now. I was so desperate to be accepted, I changed everything about myself, I got new clothes, I listened to all the music they were listening to, but nothing was enough. Turns out looking the part does not erase one's neurodivergence. Also, on top of all of this, I realized I was queer in middle school when I developed a massive crush on one of my best friends. But I was too terrified to confess to anyone because I was worried that people wouldn't accept me. Which, if you're reading between the lines here, you will understand and know that my fear of coming out was absolutely tied to my fear of being abandoned again. Now we enter high school, and all these years of feeling lonely and friendless and like something was wrong with me resulted in, you guessed it, depression. Uh, and yes, therapy did help. Um, I highly recommend therapy, by the way, to anyone, regardless if you think you need it. It is a great experience. Uh, I've been going for nine years. Um, but what helped me even more was the communities that I found online. Communities full of people like me, fellow adoptees, other artists, nerds, people who have become my lifelong friends, who validated my special interests and helped me realize that life was worth living. I learned the language with which I described myself to you today from those earliest days. I learned about queerness, about queer history, from queer people who reassured me that I was not broken. The internet saved my life, and without it, I would not be standing here today. So sure, maybe I'm addicted to my screen. Call me and my generation lazy and entitled and self-absorbed, but I challenge you to think past that. Are we actually lazy, or do we prioritize mental health in a way that academia and capitalism disfavors? Are we entitled? Is our, or is our activism seen as disrespectful to generations of people who were raised to never challenge authority's status quo? Are we really self-absorbed, or are we documenting memories and sharing them with our friends in a way that technology has been developed to allow? Never before in human history have we been able to witness world tragedies as they're happening live from primary sources who are there streaming gunfire, and violence, and other unspeakable things. Yes, the internet is dangerous, it can traumatize you, it can be incredibly addictive, but it's not only something to fear, because the people I met online saved me. There's duality in everything, even in concepts seemingly straightforward, like gratitude. I am grateful 
for a lot of things, even my adoption, as messy and as complicated as it is, because all this pain made me who I am today, but I also feel the weight of all of my identities as they've grown to become political talking points, discussed and debated as if I'm not a real live person standing right here, because once again, like grade school, I am othered simply for existing. I've learned that all these messy and complicated, beautiful feelings, they can all coexist. I can be grateful for the life that I lead here and for the opportunities I have, and I can still hold within me the pain from the biggest question I've been asking my entire life. Why? Why was I abandoned? I'll carry this unknown with me for the rest of my life. But what I do know is that by talking about my experiences and sharing them openly with people, I've been able to find community and connect with those for whom my story resonates on a personal level. And for everyone else who might not share my specific pains, I can only hope that you will find your own comfort and catharsis experiencing Sonder like I have, and that you go forth after tonight listening for all the untold stories, the lives around you. I'm gonna I'm gonna start the conversation in a kind of innocuous way, actually, and just ask you, what did you think? You haven't watched this, I yeah, assume, a in, in a while. So, what did you think watching it again? It's interesting how my words from even just like two years ago is still really relevant today. Um, like today is the day the election announced <laughs> election results were announced, and just even just like listening to this, I'm like, wow, like it's all still relevant. Um, and uh, I, I knew that it would be when I pitched it to you guys, but like it just hits that much harder, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, it's interesting how the, the things that I uh said in that speech have just grown to mean all that and more um which is why i'm excited to talk about it today yeah. um because we had a time limit i wasn't able to talk about all the things that i wanted to talk about and also i have grown as a person and i have progressed um time has passed and mm -hmm. yeah so. right and you've had a chance to ponder these things as we have yeah. as well mm -hmm. um uh, well, let me invite you first, Joanne, to give you know your reaction to what you heard and also what you'd my, like us to focus my, on. My reaction is um, I'm like digesting it. Um, as you said, as you said earlier um, in in the clip, um, you know, you walk past people and they're they're living these deep and vivid, interesting, you know, colorful lives, and you just don't know. And um, and to know that whatever kind of life that I'm living or whatever kind of challenges or difficulties that I may be facing or even questions about my own identity, the person that just walked by me, they pretty much are possibly going through the same thing. And, um, as you, and you also mentioned that you're part of Gen Z. Yeah. Well, I'm, 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 a, I'm a Gen X mm -hmm. woman. And on, I stumble over the pronouns Mm -hmm. And it's it's not malicious or um, or trying to dismiss someone else's identity. It's kind of a hard wiring, and I um, so if I miss if I misidentify you through pronouns, it's it's not it's not anything negative. It's I'm still learning to be flexible, linguistically flexible. Um, and I think that is something that, as a as a society and as as your neighbors, um, it's the least we can do. Saying that I see you through um, a verbal conversation. Trying is you know. better than not trying. Y yes, this is true. And also, I joke about this, but a good way to uh, help with the pronoun things is, is is you can you can pretend that I am just a bunch of bees in a skin suit, and so you're referring to multiple bees, so you say they. <laughs> it, it, yeah. I mean, it's a good point, and, and literally, I'm sure you have developed, as a, a, other LGBTQIA people have developed the ability to speak to cis people or other people who are not as aware of what 
you know, of, yeah. of, of and it's what... all just practice too. I think yes. like what what I advocate for is like with regards to pronouns specifically is that like if you mess up, you just correct yourself and move on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the worst thing that somebody can do is just like immediately begin like self-flagellating and being like, oh, I'm so sorry, like blah, 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 blah. Because then it just makes it about you. And then it forces, for example, me to be like, oh, that's okay when like it isn't but like it, it, it puts it puts the person who you just misgendered in a weird spot mm -hmm. so the best thing you can do is just say like oh sorry they and mm -hmm. then continue talking just correct yourself and keep yeah moving. And keep yeah. it moving yeah there were so many things that you that you raised in that that talk um, and you know you we've just touched on one of them which is uh, so many things related to your identity yeah. and we just touched on one of them which has to do with your you know with your your queerness your 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 non-binary status and therefore how to be addressed and all that there's that thing there's the hyphen yeah. right the hyphen between Chinese American there's the adoption the the the, the, the uh, you know again you clarify transracial adoption international adoption uh, there, there are those things as well, and then there's just the there's ADHD as well, which yeah, again, as you say, very, <laughs> very um, poignantly, bringing us all back to middle school and elementary school when anything like that was regarded and and treated by others by peers as something that was just ew, ew, weird. And I think that's the through line, like like why I centered this whole thing around the concept of Sonder because like when you're in elementary school or whatever they're like oh like you know everybody has feelings like you know if you're mean to somebody you're hurting somebody's feelings and you're trying to appeal to like a child's sense of morality mm -hmm. and like in a way I see Sonder as like the adult version of that is that like everybody has their problems and their fears and their hopes and their dreams and you will never know someone until you ask them, until you listen. So that was like the big through line is that no matter who watches this talk or listens to it or whatever, that um, I my hope was that people left thinking, at least thinking about like, hey, you know, maybe I should listen to people. <laughs> maybe, maybe I should stop assuming things about people or um, at least be open to hearing different perspectives that differ from your own because that's how we all learn and that's how we all move forward together and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. learn about our neighbors so that we can care about people because it sucks that in this political climate, caring about people around you is such a politicized thing. Um, so right, it right. is what well, it, it is. <laughs> but I'm trying to challenge that with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's something um, that I identify with you, and I, I don't really talk about it because um, growing up, you just kind of, we were, I was taught to just, I just had to work harder, um, yeah. study more. Um, you have ADHD. I'm dyslectic. Yeah. Um, and um, so. learning to type really helped because I didn't really know, I didn't really see the alphabet in order anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Keyboard's all yeah, yeah. And, and it's touch. It's a touch. It's not yeah. so much, you know, I'm look. And so it's the stigma of, I didn't learn to read till I was in the third grade. Mm -hmm. And so I was, there, I was called names, you know, yeah. slow, um, um, retarded. Yeah. Um, they didn't have all these nice, neat, um, politically correct terms as they do now. And, um, and also the light came on that not only was I dyslectic, but I was nearsighted. So a lot of things mm -hmm. I wasn't seeing anyway. Yeah, it was hard to, yeah. Yeah, so, and it's, I, I get it. And then, then when you are going through all these changes, trying to understand what's going on with you, and you're being talked about, but not talked to. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, hello, I'm sitting right here. Can somebody, can you guys, like the adults, can you guys talk to me, not just talk about me while I'm sitting here? Yeah, I remember you, like, the first time I think I remember experiencing like a racial microaggression was I was in, I believe, New Jersey for, uh, I, I was raised Catholic, so mm -hmm. we did, uh, they called them mission trips, but we weren't trying to convert anybody, which is just marginally better than the mission <laughs> trips where you're trying to convert people. Mm -hmm. So it was right. just a community so, service trip. Right, it was just right. community service. No That's all we were doing. Well, yeah. It's a bit <laughs> we were making people read Bibles or whatever. But anyway, I went on several of these like community service trips. 
Um, and I remember volunteering, we were volunteering at this school to help clean it or whatever, and these classrooms were absolutely disgusting. Uh, so we were cleaning um, and sanitizing everything and uh, whatnot. And I remember just sitting there, you know, doing my work uh, and hearing the director of the school talking to someone else, like another staff member, mm -hmm. about me. Mm -hmm. And they were calling me like that Asian girl. Oh. And it was really like, weird because I'd never been referred to in that way before in my life like and that was like middle school maybe I don't remember how old I was when mm -hmm. I went on this trip but like it was the weirdest most uncomfortable feeling because I was like I'm right here and I've also never been called like that Asian girl like 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 I ugh, it was so deeply uncomfortable because like I don't know if any of you have been to Acton, Massachusetts, but there's a very large uh, Asian American yeah, population absolutely. there. Um, so I grew up going to school with a lot of people who looked like me, um, except the main difference is that almost no one was adopted. A lot of people spoke Mandarin or uh, whatever languages at home, mm -hmm. um, and I didn't. Um, and so that made me feel, that, that contributed to my feeling of feeling like other, like I'm not Chinese enough. Cause like I, I went to Chinese school for like 10 years and then I took four years of Chinese at high school, like in high school. And I'm still nowhere near fluent and that's mainly because my parents don't speak. So during like those 10 years of Chinese school, my mother was like trying to learn alongside me. So that didn't really help cause we never practiced at home speaking in Chinese. Meanwhile, every other person in my class spoke at home. Mm -hmm. um, so did you, let, let me just in, in, ask a question I've been wondering about, which is, uh, are you an example of the trans racial? Tra uh, no. Okay, so you. I, so that's, that's like layer on layer on layer is that mm -hmm. like, I'm a Chinese person adopted by Chinese people, but, um, my dad is a first-gen immigrant, and he doesn't speak Chinese. Um, his grand or his parents, my grandparents, um, they speak Cantonese and Toisanese and Mandarin. Mm -hmm. uh, Toisanese is like their regional dialect mm -hmm. um, from the village that they're from, Toisan. Mm -hmm. uh, and then on my mom's side, my mom's family has been uh, in Hawaii for like the past five generations. Mm. Um, our family, like ancestors they got there in the late 1800s um and they've lived there ever since um so they don't speak chinese um okay so. so so uh you like how much of a chinese uh how much of a culturally chinese uh upbringing did you receive um if, i think again, i think we no were trying involved, right like okay. we, we didn't really have the language but like because my dad's parents, my grandparents on my dad's side were so, uh, like they, they, they immigrated here, so mm -hmm. they still had a lot of culture. So we'd celebrate Chinese New Year with them. We do um, like those kinds of holidays. We learned about Chinese customs, whatnot. Um, but ultimately, like we were raised Catholic, or at least my mom's Catholic, so we were raised Catholic. Um, I am no longer Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, on my mom's side, my family is this big blend of like Chinese, uh, Hawaiian culture. We have some native Hawaiians who've married into our family. Um, and it's just a big right. smorgasbord mm -hmm. of culture there. So like I got a lot of like Hawaiian culture too, cause like we'd go back and visit multiple times. Um, so like, you know, I would learn things like, like Hawaiian culture traditions, um, you know, but like, yeah. my mom would cook Chinese food and whatnot. Um, but it was definitely a very weird, unique experience that like even other adoptees, it was hard to relate to because a lot of Chinese adoptees were transracially adopted because they were adopted by white people. Mm -hmm. And so like when you look at a family picture, they're very obviously adopted versus me, you look at a picture of my family, you can't tell that me and my brother were both adopted. Mm -hmm. um, and my sister was is my parents' like biological child, um, so. Right. So like our family of, looks all the same because we're all Chinese, right. but Which, again, we're actually like said, from very different parts of, of China. Yeah. Because um, I'm from a tiny island off the coast, off the southern coast. My brother is from Sichuan, which is more like center. Um, uh, I'm not actually sure where my mom's family line originated from. I think somewhere near Hong Kong, and then my dad's side is definitely from the Hong Kong area. Mm -hmm. So. So um, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so there's like a, a, a stigma attached to. Um, B 
being, um, you know, Chinese but not knowing the language? I definitely, it, it might be mostly self-imposed. Um, it's, it's me feeling, I feel incredibly bad about myself that um, I am Chinese but I can't speak Mandarin. Um, this was exacerbated when uh, I was a freshman in high school. I took a return trip to China. It was like this big tour where it was all like these adoptees who were all going back for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, it was a very moving experience for me, but something that like in, you know, the months leading up to the trip, we like hard were like, yeah, we're gonna learn Chinese. We're gonna get good, you know, whatever. And so like, that was probably the strongest my Chinese was because we had, we hired a tutor to come help our entire family learn like conversational skills, whatnot. And then like, I was able to vaguely, very basically communicate when I was there. Um, but it, it, it was, it was just really hard. Like, knowing that every other Chinese person I met likely had a very different experience growing up, that they were more connected and going back to the theme of identity, like I was trying to figure out like, what am I? Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, I'm a person of color and America is very white. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone else, you know, like we talk about immigrants, we talk about America being a melting pot. Like everybody was immigrants because the Native Americans were here first. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, um, but that feeling of being unwanted, um, you know, f for various aspects, which we talked about in the talk, like whether or not that's having been adopted, I was abandoned at some point, um, not having friends in middle school, that whole feeling comes back again, feeling like I don't even belong within Chinese communities due to that disconnect from the culture. And then also like, yeah, just me trying to figure out where do I belong because like I don't really like um, America as an entity doesn't seem to want me and uh, I, I don't feel fully Chinese either because I I just have that disconnect so it's right and I have to say you know as you talk about that trip that you took uh, I, I my daughter-in-law is Vietnamese mm -hmm. um, and I I'm thinking of her in part with this, but I've known lots and lots and lots of people who are getting along in a language that is not their native language. They are learning it or they're figuring it out or they're trying mm -hmm. to to integrate themselves in some way. And the she gets so frustrated and so do does everybody, I think, when you cannot come close to presenting your whole self. Yeah. Like who, even if you're still trying to figure out who you are, you want to be able to you know, have somebody else leave a conversation with you and you feel like, okay, I was myself. I, I, they know something about me. And if you're struggling for the basics of just like a simple transaction and that's as far as your language can take you, then you're stuck with a lot of things to say and no ability to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that is a very, very difficult, again, it's another kind of assault on our sense of ourselves. Yeah. Um, I also grew up like being told by a lot of other people, whether they were Chinese or not, that they didn't think I was also Chinese because like I'm from the very, very south, so like very close to Vietnam actually. So very commonly because of colorism, you know, I mm -hmm. get very tan in the summer. Um, people would be like, oh, you're not Chinese. Like you must be, insert literally anything else. Um, I get Vietnamese very commonly, which makes a little bit of sense because I was mm -hmm. born so, so close, close to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. So like at least that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but like even from other Chinese people, I'd be like, oh, like they'd ask me, oh, where are you from? I'm like, oh, China. They're like, no, you're not. Like I've literally been told, no, you're not. I'm like, what do you mean? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> like it's, it's, it, and that's just the issue of colorism, right? Like that's, that's like, especially with East Asian communities, it's, it's people like it's, they look down on people with darker skin. And then that, you know, that goes into the whole issue of like anti-blackness within the East Asian communities, mm -hmm. you know, with Korean like skin bleaching and like all of these other things, mm -hmm. like being pale is seen as a good thing because that means you can be inside. You're not outside working all day. You have, you can afford to be inside. So it's seen as a wealth thing mm -hmm. um, versus mm -hmm. very dark people. They're like, oh, those are the laborers. And so that's seen as less than. Mm -hmm. um, and so like it definitely like did a number on me being like being told by other Chinese people, no, you're not Chinese just because I'm a little bit darker than them, mm -hmm. which is wild. Right, which yeah, I think this. you know a little bit about this, <laughs> I think. Yeah, I the, 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 other end, the other end of the spectrum as a, as a um, 
woman of color, African American. It's same but different. Yeah. Whereas um, coming out of the history of slavery and exactly. being mixed race and you know being it, the lighter you are, you're perceived as being more privileged yeah. and. Um, out of the the history of the of the plantation, the lighter ones were more preferred to be in the house. Yeah. The darker ones were in the field, and because most likely the lighter ones were children of of, of the master, and they were afforded opportunities and whatnot. So, and you know, me being that that shade where I'm I'm dark enough for you to know that I'm black, yeah. but I'm not dark enough to frighten you know people. Yeah. It's all about proximity to whiteness. Yes, yes. And so I, to some degree, I get accepted in some cir some circles. Then in some places, you know, because of the way I, I, I speak or the way I carry myself, and I enter a room, the first thing I get is, a, who does she think she is? You know, mm -hmm. she thinks she's better than. And all I've said is, hello, good morning, how yeah. are you? Am I in the right room? And it's, it, it's, it's, it's the being identified by others. Yeah. Um, other people la label you, labeling you as a wannabe, like wannabe white, or being stuck up, or having an attitude. It's it's other people, lab you know, identifying you instead of you know, p me taking my power back and saying this is who I am. Yeah. And I also experienced um, being a part of um, or being in a toxic community. Mm -hmm. And I and I decided to just leave yeah and I knew that wherever I went uh, I'll be black there I don't need to be a part of a collective to own my identity mm -hmm. I can go someplace and live someplace and be around friends and neighbors and be embraced and say yeah this is who I am and this is where I live and yes yes I I, I am a woman of color I don't have to stay stuck in a toxic place just for the sake of being accepted and embraced by a group of people who are basically rejecting me. Yeah. You know, and, and that, that's that's the way I that's the way I feel about it. And as far as, you know, you tell people who you are and all of a sudden say, "No, you're not." I'm like <laughs> Yeah. Well, Cuz I think that just that makes it that right? much harder to claim your labels and claim your identity. Mm -hmm. Um because people are just as quick to try to deny you those identity uh, or identifiers because you're not enough for certain groups. Mm -hmm. so. And I, I would like to, yeah, actually jump in and, and share something from, from my own history, which is, I imagine, I'll, let me just ask you, what do you think I am? Uh, I mean, I'd say white. <laughs> well, wouldn't you just right? Yeah. <laughs> right. And you know, but would you say white? No. You 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 know something different, I, I, right? I, I you you pass, but I I see you. Yeah. I That's I, what I she think tells like... me a certain amount of the time, right? And so here's my deal. My deal is that my family is Puerto. My father's family is Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. He was born into poverty, as was I, in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but he was on his way to digging his way out of poverty at mm -hmm. the time I was born and my brother and sister. By the time I was nine years old, he had managed to work for an oil company for a couple of years, enough where he got an offer to move to Peru because mm -hmm. he spoke Spanish, mm -hmm. kind of. Kind of. Um, <laughs> and that started a, a rest of my childhood was spent outside of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to talk about that in, f for just a, a second, in a second. But my father was working hard to escape his past, yeah. as so many people in his position have over the last 50 years and many, many more. Um, and in, in so doing, he denied uh, in his life, in every way he could, his Puerto Ricanness, mm -hmm. leaving me to think of myself as a as a white man until I went to Peru mm -hmm. as a nine-year-old and I went on a bus ride which was determined how I feel that you you said why why you have your own why why was I abandoned I have my why my why comes from being a nine-year-old kid on a bus going to school in Peru uh, and my head, my, my, my uh, nose up against the glass as we passed through what my brother and I called Tideville. And we called it that because 
the shacks that we passed were made out of tide boxes and the like and the kids that I was looking at in their front yards, which were, you know, an old tire or something like that, they look, to me, they didn't look, they look like me. And I look like them. And I'm like, why, why? Why am I on this bus yeah. in a nice little uniform? Yeah, why do I get to be here? You know, and I, I had, like I said, my first five years, six years was in the projects of New York. I mean, I, I knew what, you know, the, the American urban equivalent of, of what I was looking at out there, I had been in, yeah. but I wasn't in there anymore, and I was a kid. Yeah. I, and I, trying to figure that out. It's, it's, like what, it's like what you're saying, you know. Um, you, you didn't choose. It was chosen for you, but because you were so close to the real close to the proximity of whiteness you had that you had the chance to you know assimilate i've lived a whole life as a white person i mean i am i'm functionally white because of my privilege the privilege that i have is that of an educated white person mm -hmm. but interestingly enough my siblings and myself our tension around our identity is that we don't feel um we don't have the cred ourselves to identify ourselves as Latinos, because we have too easy a life for that as we see it. Oh. And that's a very weird thing because, of course, that's also assuming that all Latinos suffer, which is not at all true anyway. Mm -hmm. But I, well, you like know, what's my like problem is like, oh, I'm not, I'm not really Puerto Rican because everybody treats me like I'm white. But I no, think that's I, just, it goes into the conversation of being white passing um, I think um, I personally obviously I'm, I'm not white passing but I have a lot of friends who are and I've and I've listened to a lot of conversations between uh, either mixed race folk or just white passing people of color and um, I think talking about identity and being denied a part of yourself mm -hmm. um, I, I think you you should allow yourself to have as much claim over calling yourself Latino as anybody else um, I mean, obviously, you acknowledge your privilege of being white passing Latino, but you're still Latino. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's. It, but it's interesting that it doesn't really feel that yeah. way because of the way yeah. I'm treated by others. Like it's you all said, about I mean, we want to be the people that we see ourselves as, mm -hmm. and we want to present ourselves to the world that way. But th it's just not that simple. Yeah, identity, identity, identity is is um, multi layered. I yeah. mean, w um, those of us who definitely cannot pass for white, we have a part of our identity that is just in your face, and we have to accept it and embrace it. Whereas you, you, you have to say to the world, yes. I may be white passing, but I am also Latino, and I'm proud of it. And yeah. it, it, so it comes from what what I've said before. You know, every person has a right to 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 tell the world, "This is who I am." No, you don't get to tell me who I am. I tell you who I am. Mm -hmm. You don't identify me. I identify myself. Yeah. And um, so, and and as a society as a whole, if we could just all of us as a whole could just except what the person's saying. I am A, B, C, and D. Treat me as, as so. And that goes to what, what Nala was saying about, about listening mm -hmm. to others and being open mm -hmm. and understanding that. Uh, I, I was thinking when you were talking way back in the conversation about this very thing that, uh, so when driving. Yeah. Um, if I'm if I'm driving and my wife is in the passenger seat and somebody does something really he's a they're a jerk mm -hmm. and I just say oh what a jerk what a mass hole <laughs> yeah. what what a jerk and my wife says quite often you know maybe they're in a hurry for a good reason mm. or maybe they're having a really bad, bad day. day she just goes right to that place mm. of understanding that there's a there could be a story there mm -hmm. there doesn't mean that because that person just cut you off that that's how they always drive and that that's how they always are and that 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 et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. and we're doing that all the time yeah and i think it's good to think like that because like if you offer that sort of empathy to other people, that that sense of understanding or taking people, uh, like giving them benefit of the doubt, I think that's good because like, you know, sometimes people are just jerks and that's fine. But um, 
I think in this world, unfortunately, kindness is seen as a weakness, mm. um, which sucks because also people take advantage of kindness, which also sucks. <laughs> um, because yeah, like I've had I've had that happen to me, and I've sort of been sitting here like, what are my options, right? Do I do I be less kind? Do I offer less of myself to people when I get left behind or betrayed or whatever? Like, or, or do I just keep being kind? Well, you, we you never are, know. <laughs> I mean, you set the stage for where we are on this day. As yeah. you said, it's 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 the day mm. after Election Day, and we're all coming to terms as best we can yeah. in the short term with what we're looking at here. Mm -hmm. But it does feel like it's going to get even more challenging to do what you just said, yeah. which yeah. is to stay kind. And I, and um, I and I and I am grateful for um, the the happenstance of us meeting. I know, it was so random. And and then, then, <laughs> then we were both waiting for the bus that never came. And so we decided to just take the walk home. And on the walk home, that's when the conversation began. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have to, again, to go back to your talk, you have to be open yes. uh, yeah. to these kinds of things. I'm very spontaneous in that way. And, I, and that's how we met. So uh, for context for everyone else, uh, <laughs> I had a friend in town from out of town and, and she and I were like, let's do something together. And I was like, oh, let's do trivia. So she came all the way out here to do trivia with me and uh, a bunch of you guys were all at one table. The and my team, right? Yep, and, and, and because it was like communal seating, there was just two of us. Um, someone at your table was like, oh, come sit with us and mm -hmm. join our team. And I was like, that sounds great. So me and my friend sit down and we end up having a great conversation with everybody. And then, yeah, we're both waiting for the bus home. And uh, you said, you, you were like, I don't want to walk home. I'm scared of all the bunnies and the rats <laughs> and the whatnot. And I was like, you know what? Like, you live just a little bit farther than I do, and it's like a 10-minute walk. Let's walk together. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to walk home because, yeah, no bus came. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, and then we started talking, and, I, and, and then I met you again at Town Day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now, and now, we now we're here. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I think that just even the circumstances of this interview, I think, really goes to show with, like, the spontaneous just saying yes to things mm -hmm. and being open to new experiences. Yes. Um, and I think that's, I've had a lot of experiences in my life where being spontaneous or being open to meeting new people or just saying yes to things um, have led to really interesting friendships and situations where I would have otherwise never met you guys like I didn't even know we had a news station here <laughs> so, right like like I have lived in Ar I moved to Arlington after graduating college um, finally moved out of my parents house uh, and got an apartment here with some friends uh, and so this is like my, my third year living here mm -hmm. Um, yeah, three years. There are people who've lived here ten year, ten times as long as you have, right. and, and don't know that ACMI mm -hmm. is around. So that is our identity, one of our identity issues, and it truly is. I, I, I was I was being glib about it there, but I do think that we at ACMI we feel like we're a certain kind of we're, we're we're the kinds of people that we are, but we're also a certain kind of organization and yeah. a certain kind of resource within the town yeah. that that is healthful. It yeah. is healthful for the life of the community. And to labor in obscurity, number one, is similar to not being seen yeah. um, yes. in a lot of ways. And it, it, is, it is so important that we, f that we have each other's backs mm -hmm. um, as a result of that. And the people who are here uh, are people that I feel an intense loyalty to. I, I loved my previous jobs. I was a teacher for many years and I mm -hmm. loved doing that. But I feel more loyal to this group of people than I ever have in my working life before. Mm -hmm. And it really does have a lot to do with this sense that you're doing something that feels important to you and yeah. you're quite sure is a gift for the world that you can give and or is at least something you have to offer. Yeah. yeah, that's good. I think that's why I do what I do. Like when I was in high school and decided I wanted to be an artist, I uh, 
my whole goal was to increase the positive representation of marginalized groups in media. I originally went to school to do visual development for animated films. I really wanted to work at Pixar because uh, I, I loved animation and I still do. Um, and I was like, you know, if I can be in the room to help create diverse concepts and advocate for diverse characters being on screen, like every child deserves to watch something and see themselves in people. Mm -hmm. yes. um, and there's so many really important cultural films that are coming out uh, or that have come out since I was young. Um, Turning Red is very good. Mm -hmm. Over the Moon, very good. These are all animated films that, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, mean something to a lot of people because they're so entrenched in cultural heritage of the people who made the film. Mm -hmm. uh, same with, uh, oh, what is it called? Elements or whatever. It's, it's a Pixar film that kind of crashed and burned because the people marketing it did not know how to market it. Uh -huh. um, please watch it. It's really good. Elements. Um, elements. Yes. I think it's called Elements. It's, it's, it's about like all these different elements, but the actual like, core theme is about immigrants and about um, it's like a own voice story. Uh, the director was talking about what it was like growing up as a like first gen immigrant, um, and the uh, the what's it called? Uh, the metaphor of like different elements represent like different racial groups. Mm. Um, and unfortunately, the movie, the way it was marketed, did not bring that across at all. So when I sat down to watch, I was like, I don't know how good this will be, but it's the new Pixar movie, whatever. And I was like, actually, this is really good. And I loved the relationship between the daughter, the main character, and her father. Mm -hmm. And I wish they focused on that instead of the romance mm -hmm. plot. Um, I thought the, the familial aspects were very good. Mm -hmm. Anyways, I decided once in college, I didn't really want to work in animation because that industry is kind of on fire right now, but also what creative industry isn't on fire right now. Mm -hmm. um, but I pivoted into tabletop games and um, I get a lot of sense of self and a lot of sense of pride bringing myself and my perspective to this work. And now that I uh, am an art director, I am in a position of power where I can hire diverse artists who bring their um, unique perspectives to every single piece of work that they touch. And um, it means a lot to me and I get a lot of fulfillment from my work uh, doing that um, because tabletop games are another form of storytelling and mm -hmm. um, especially is very empowering for marginalized people because if we don't have films about us, uh, and whatnot, we can use tabletop games to write our own stories and mm -hmm. put ourselves into the spotlight. Uh, which right, is... and it's, I, I think it, it's, it's a great point because I was just realizing as you were saying that that the thing the thing about tabletop games and perhaps many other things, yes. but that distinguishes them from music and film and theater and stuff like that is all those things take a huge amount of investment and, yeah. and time. Uh, and crews and all that stuff and for you to want to and to, to be impelled to participate directly in a project that pushes forward in some small way even uh, that that sense of embracing mm -hmm. each other's yeah. diversity being open uh, helping somebody understand something that they didn't understand before it's, and it's accessible to you in that way yeah. as the artist that's really cool and it's 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 really cool because um, uh, it, it is basically just collaborative storytelling that that's mm -hmm. all tabletop RPGs are um, you're telling a story together with a group mm -hmm. of people and maybe you roll some dice or draw some cards or you know play Jenga there's a lot of really cool games out there um, but uh, in that everyone at the table has the agency to put as much of themselves into those stories as they want to. And then with actual play, which is the, basically you just record yourself playing the games, you can stream them on Twitch or just post to YouTube or whatnot. Um, we are making our own space to tell our own stories. Mm -hmm. And I think there's just something so powerful about that. Um, because you know, if, if white people won't give us the time of day, we're gonna make our own space, put our own stories out there, and the people who want to come find them will come find them. And mm -hmm. um, I've been honored to be a part of so many really cool projects like that. Yeah. Well, that uh, I have to say is a very hopeful note on which uh, to end. What has yeah. been, um, you know, I think it qualifies for our series as an important conversation that's real. Um, that talked about a bunch of stuff that don't 
doesn't usually get talked about, especially it's hard having these hard rolling. conversations. Yeah, yeah. So because you don't just sit down for brunch and be like, "All right, what are you sad about today?" <laughs> like people don't do that. Yeah. So <laughs> we're gonna have to wrap things up because we wondered whether we would go for half an hour or an hour before we started. Right? Well, that hour went fast. Yeah, it sure went did. fast, but it is. I told you I talk a lot. <laughs> it is done. Um, so I want to thank our guest first and foremost. Thank you. Um, Nala J. Thank Wu you. is a, as, as they said, an, an art director and activist here in Arlington. Um, and my colleague Joanne Clinton, whose contributions, as always, were thoughtful and valuable. I'm James Milan. This is Let's Talk About. We will see you next time. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.